Um, uh, now we'll go to question and answer. You've heard uh, both a more optimistic and a more pessimistic view on our, what will happen in Iraq, and you've also heard uh, some uh, differences of opinion on uh, what we should do in Iraq, uh, either uh, uh, excuse me, Afghanistan, and also some differences on Pakistan. So uh, that should prove uh, some um, uh, provide some grist for uh, good questions here. So who would like to uh, right here? I'm uh, Jed Schilling, and the very interesting uh, presentations that highlighted the complexity of this whole situation. And I think they underline the fact that um, the wars from the beginning were serious mistakes and have gotten us into a deep quagmire, which I think needs to be emphasized because uh, one of my questions, and I've, I've got another comment after this, is in order to get support to get the, out of the war, uh, it's not just a criticism of Obama, but to build support across the political spectrum in this country to recognize the facts that you were stating and the necessity of getting out, because he's being criticized on the right for not wanting to stay in forever. So I think it's very important to build that kind of broad support in order to make this progress and get out. Um, on the um, in case in Afghanistan, I think it's important in the exit as we work out, because uh, I have a number of Afghan friends and my daughter worked there for a couple of years, to within the Taliban be willing to make the separation between the nationalist segment who really wants to govern the country and the dictatorial segment which led before, which imposed incredibly severe uh, rules on behavior and things throughout the country, blew up the uh, Buddhist statues and things like that, uh, which is not the one we would want to have as an ally. My third question to Peter in Iraq is, given the uh, conflict between the Kurds and the other Iraqis over the oil on the borders of Kurdistan, how does that get settled in order to separate a Kurdistan from the rest of Iraq? Okay, Peter, you want to handle that question? Well, let, let me begin by just making clear uh, that I'm not in favor of withdrawal from Afghanistan. I have reservations about additional troops because I don't think they can accomplish their, their counterinsurgency mission because there is no credible partner. But I think the consequences of withdrawal uh, at this point in time would be disastrous for many people in Afghanistan uh, and that we have accomplished a lot and we are not viewed uh, as an alien body in the way that we are in Arab Iraq. Um, well, I'm just, I'm just making clear that, uh, so, uh, I, I, in some ways, I think there were three bad choices. More troops, but I think that was ineffective uh, because there's no credible local partner. Withdrawal, which would lead to rapid deterioration, and the current situation, which is gradual deterioration. Uh, but in the real world, uh, they're, they're not uh, happy solutions. The second point I'd make, it doesn't follow that if we withdraw the Taliban are going to come and be the government. Uh, you know, remember, 55 percent of the country are Tajiks, Hazaras, Uzbeks. These are groups that the Taliban has no support, and many Pashtuns don't support the Taliban. Uh, so if we were, I mean, it's conceivable if we were to completely disengage, yes, then the Taliban would be, have some possibility maybe of, of you know, taking advantage of chaos and in Kabul where the Afghan other groups started to fight each other as they did in the uh, early 90s. But if we remain engaged even with a small number of troops or even without troops, <laughs> the Taliban is not going to come back and take power. Uh, it also, there may be formula for it uh, to include uh, in parts of the country, uh, you know, that the, there would be room for a very conservative uh, Islamic party that would embody the Taliban. But, uh, when you speak to your daughter, don't, don't be under any illusions as to what that would mean for women in the country. I, you know, let's not, let's not pretend that it's going to be something different than what it's going to be. Um, on the issue of um, oil in, in uh, Iraq, well, I mean, there is, a, there, is some, there, there is something in the Iraqi Constitution that basically uh, addresses this, uh, which says that uh, which provides for revenue sharing uh, from the 
uh, what, what are the existing oil fields and then allows the regions, of which there's really only one, Kurdistan, to develop their own resources. And this has been, this has been incredibly important to the Kurds because if you talk to any Kurd, um, what they'll say about the oil of Iraq is that they wish Iraq never had any oil because it was used to finance the, the, the oppression of the Kurds, purchase the chemical weapons that killed them, and, and, and for the physical destruction. So for them, having even if the revenues are pooled, and they say they're willing to do that, although they're not constitutionally required to, it, for them it is that they, they have their own independent source of revenue. That's really the, the critical element. In terms of how it works on territory, uh, it's Kirkuk largest oil field, which they've agreed should be managed by the central government, uh, but which they believe should be part of Kurdistan, and the Constitution says there should be a referendum which hasn't been held. If Kurdistan became fully independent, uh, what would, ha I guess, Kir I mean, inevitably Kirkuk would go with it. I, I suppose it, I'm not sure it would give Kurdistan an outsized share of the total oil resources. Uh, because there's so much that exists in the south, and frankly, there's almost certainly oil in the Sunni areas. It's a, it's a matter that was never explored. Okay, uh, right here. Um, I, I think we should get to another. That was kind of a long question. I'll talk to you after about it. Is that okay? Yeah, my name is Richard Youngflesh. I'm with the Northern Community College. Um, with regard to Afghanistan, the existence of the heroin trade, I think, is, we should be a threat to not only our well-being, but to the whole world. So why don't we make that a major focus of an effort? Uh, and it's also the major funding for the Taliban itself. Uh, well, I'll take a crack at that. I think, uh, you know, we've done everything uh, since 9-11 except really focused. Uh, now, we have made efforts against al-Qaeda, but we, we've really focused on Iraq. Then we got into nation building uh, and drug interdiction in um, Afghanistan and actually drug eradication. And I think everybody in Afghanistan makes money off the drugs, not just the Taliban. Of course, the best thing to do would probably be to cut the demand off by a ra really radical solution would be, of course, to legalize uh, drugs in the U.S., but no one's really going to do that. So uh, that would take the fire out of the, uh, some of the insurgency right there, or if they did it in Europe as well. But no one, no one of course, is going to be doing that. But I think, you know, if you're going out and you're eradicating uh, poppy fields, uh, the population is not going to support you. They're going to go over to the Taliban. And I think that's why the U.S. military was very reluctant to do these types of things um, earlier in Afghanistan. Now, of course, they've stopped. Obama's changed the policy a bit, as I understand it. He's not, he's gone away from that and more trying to get the traffickers and that sort of thing uh, rather than the actual growers, which is an improvement in the policy, but it's still, it's still sort of a sidelight. I think we need to get back on what we're what we should be focused on, and that is, uh, it's a tragic that uh, uh, you know Afghanistan's uh, major export is uh, opium, but and and uh, which has turned into heroin. But you know, the U.S. has to pay attention to we, what we haven't paid attention to sufficiently. I don't think, and that is uh, with your eyes on the threat and uh, anything that helps us get Al Qaeda. Uh, and bin Laden, and I think, uh, you know, Chuck is right. Uh, just because you get bin Laden, that doesn't mean that the show's over, but, but you've got to uh, concentrate on that and anything that takes your eyes off that, including fighting the Taliban, in my estimation, uh, should be put aside. I mean, we can talk about what's good for the people of Afghanistan and what's good for the people of Iraq, but I think, first of all, we have to keep our eyes on our own security as well. And that's really uh, what we failed to do uh, uh, since 9-11. Okay. Who's, uh, yeah, Carl. Carl Kuhn. I certainly applaud the central thrust, which is that we need to uh, achieve a public recognition that the enemy is not Taliban, it's al-Qaeda, and uh, reframe our attitudes accordingly. It's an uphill job changing American opinion. I applaud your efforts here. Meanwhile, I have one specific uh, problem I would like to ask about. Uh, I've seen reports that in arming the police and developing the army of Afghanistan, we're having a lot of success uh, recruiting Tajiks who operate now as a strong plurality of the police of the army, and not much success uh, recruiting Pashtuns who are 
de joining and defecting in considerable numbers and are considerably outnumbered in the Army. And it seems to me if and when we do get out, uh, we're just uh, making it possible for opposing uh, factions to kill each other at longer range. Now, what do we do about that? Peter, you want to take that? or? Uh, well, this, of course, goes back to the history of, of how the current government came into power, which is that we aligned ourselves, uh, or we backed, the Northern Alliance, which was primarily a Tajik uh, movement. Um, I'm not sure that most of the recruits are Tajik, but the, certainly the leadership of the army is Tajik. Um, the, the, the dilemma is, is very simple, um, and, and this is particularly, I think, true in the, the police. Uh, if, you, if, if you recruit, uh, uh, I'll talk about the police and then just a, a, a word about the army, but if, if, the, if you recruit Pashtun policemen to serve in Kandahar, uh, if they are outside of Kandahar City, uh, they, they get eight weeks training uh, and they man a, a, a checkpoint, their chance of living through the year is probably 50 percent. And overall, the, the, the mortality rate of the police is 10 percent a year. And that's, that's not a very inviting uh, occupation. So, of course, if you're a Tajik and going to go serve in the safe Tajik areas, that's, that's fine. It's a, it's a job. But if you're a Pashtun, it's not very inviting. Um, and I, I frankly don't know how much of that same factors at play in the, in the Army. But again, my impression is that there are Pashtuns in the Army. It's just that the, that the higher ranks are Tajik. I, I think more generally, um, any time you have a uh, ethno-sectarian uh, divisions in a country and you're you're training uh, a force that's more uh, inclined to be one ethno-sectarian group than the other, if the place um, deteriorates after, it's, you know, the same could be said for Iraq. Have we trained everybody in the Civil War there? If it happens, I'm more pessimistic about it than Peter in that because I, I look over Iraqi history and I see so many uh, 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 Kurdish and Shia uh, rebellions against the Sunni government and so and also the history of these types of things and other ethno sectarian uh, problems with ethno uh, countries with problems with ethno sectarian violence it seems to come back all the time so I think anytime you train forces of one uh, side or the other uh, even if they're nominally uh, you know the Iraqi army or the Afghan army or whatever you 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 risk that that happening after you leave. And of course, the US always uh, uh, leaves these situations sooner or later, unless uh, we're talking about you know, Korea or Ger Germany or something. OK, we've got time for one more question um, right here. David Eisenberg, International Peace Research Institute, Oslo. Um, open question. Maybe Chuck wants to uh, address it. Why should anybody put any credibility in the pledge of the Obama administration to withdraw from Afghanistan by mid-2011, given the recent testimony by Secretary Gates and Clinton that at that time um, the withdrawal is not fixed but will be dependent on the assessment of the military commanders on the ground, which is certainly a dodge for we're staying? Well, I mean, I think, you know, any time a president says uh, that we're going to withdraw, uh, and this was certainly uh, true in Iraq under the, the Bush administration, and I think it's going to be true both in Iraq and Afghanistan under Obama, it's conditional. There are always conditions. I mean, the, the president didn't say unconditionally, I'm going to, we're going to start withdrawing troops in, in 18 months. Uh, they, they will look at an assessment. They will look at what's on, on the ground, and if they don't think things have gotten better, my guess is that, you know, we'll they will find a reason um, to stay. Uh, so I, I don't think anybody should be surprised by the testimony of uh, Secretary Gates, Secretary Clinton's uh, remarks about that, you know, well, we'll have to have an assessment, we'll, we'll have to wait uh, and, and see. So I think all he did was he threw a marker out there, um, you know, maybe whether it was to prod card side or to prod the, the Pakistanis, I mean, who knows? I think mostly it was for domestic political consumption. He knows this is an unpopular war at the moment. He knows that if he doesn't at least throw, you know, give some lip service to the possibility of withdrawal, that politically it, you know, will become a, a quagmire 
uh, you know, for him. So I, I, I do not necessarily put much stock in his statement that we will begin with withdrawal uh, in 18 months. Um, and the question will be whether the American public decides to hold his feet to the fire uh, 18 months from now. Um, and, you know, to sort of answer the, the part of the first question, you know, the president doesn't need, you know, to build a political coalition to decide to withdraw. He can just decide as long as he's, as he's willing to weather the political storm uh, that, it, that ensues. Uh, and that's the problem. The problem is that the president does not want to weather the political storm. Uh, and, and so he is trying to find some sort of consensus uh, on, on withdrawal. But uh, since we don't need uh, congressional approval anymore to go to war, uh, you know, and you don't need uh, funding so much to withdraw as much as you need funding to, to keep troops uh, deployed, to pr it's, you know, he can make the decision. It's, it's all about politics. Yeah, and I think uh, uh, we may not see a withdrawal from Iraq at the end of 2011 either. I mean, they can renegotiate the agreement, and Maliki has made hints that he might, you know, want to do that. So. We have that. People have taken even the Iraq war uh, withdrawal for granted, and I'm not sure we can, especially if the violence starts again, because we've got so much invested there. So I think uh, Chuck's exactly right on that point, because in the Vietnam War, when Nixon came in, uh, he was the candidate who was going to get us out of Vietnam, and he started the Vietnamization program. You saw the protests on college campuses go down until they discovered he was running, escalating the war in Cambodia and running a secret war. So I think. It just saying that, the President just saying that uh, we're going to begin withdrawing in 2011, July 2011 from Afghanistan, that quiets a lot of the anti-war left because they say, oh, problem solved, right? And and because, hey, we're eventually going to get out of here. So I think Chuck's exactly right on that. But that doesn't mean we're going to withdraw from either of these countries anytime soon, I don't think. Well, let me, if okay. I can say, first, though, I, I mean, let's be clear, Congress authorized both of these wars. Uh, I mean, one may not like it, but in fact, they did do it, and they haven't uh, they haven't repealed it. So uh, that, that that authorization's there. I, I, I think of the of President Clinton's deployment to Bosnia, which was also incidentally announced for a year. Uh, went in with very significant force. There was basic there was no violence in that year. Uh, it was successful, uh, and at the end of the year. The deployment continued with virtually no public opposition. And so what I imagine lies behind, I mean, I, I think that President Obama is sincere in what he's saying. The idea is that we bring in significant additional force, uh, seek to accomplish a mission as we did in, in Bosnia, and then that the, the situation's better and, and you hope you can withdraw. Again, I. For the reasons I outlined, I'm, which have primarily, what well, have entirely to do with the absence of a credible local partner, uh, I, I have reservations about that. O on the issue of Iraq, I, I certainly think that the withdrawal will go ahead. Uh, we never did have a strategic interest in Iraq, uh, but once we were there, of course, we've changed things, and so we do have some obligations. Uh, and I would. I would think we would want to have at least the possibility of going back in if we have to deal with Al Qaeda in the Sunni areas. And I've argued in the past, and I still think it's true, that we have an obligation to the to Kurdistan, which was on our side, it's been a reliable ally, and that obligation can be discharged by a fairly minimal security commitment of the kind that we had from 1991 until 2003 with the no-fly zone. Okay, well that's it. Thanks for coming and we're going to have a uh, lunch. <laughs> Ivan Eland is a senior fellow and director of the Center on Peace Liberty at the Independent Institute. Peter Galbraith, former U.S. Ambassador to Croatia, served as U.N. Special Representative to Afghanistan from June of 2009 to September of 2009. And Charles Pena, foreign policy advisor for the 2008 Ron Paul presidential campaign, is a senior fellow at the Independent Institute. For more information, visit independent.org.